Today we're going to talk about aplastic crises in sickle cell and how you manage them in an emergent basis overnight. The pathophysiology of aplastic crisis involves an infection of a person with any kind of a chronic hemolytic anemia um, with the virus parvovirus B19. Hemolytic anemias, sickle cell being an example, are uh, anemias in which the person maintains oxygen carrying capacity by ramping up red cell production. Parvovirus B19 attacks the erythroblast, shutting off red cell production, thus leaving this patient with a plummeting hemoglobin. Oftentimes these hemoglobins reach levels that are very serious, resulting in congestive heart failure or even death. Um, a plastic crisis is created by this virus the virus famously known for causing fifth disease. And you see this child here with this red rash on her cheeks uh, looking as if someone had slapped her. On the top picture you see the viral inclusions in the erythroblasts. So some diagnostic clues. A low hemoglobin with a low or absent reticulocyte count. Now it's going to be important these patients oftentimes have a high retic by nature, and so a person who ambiently runs around 11 or 12 percent retic count suddenly drops to 4 percent retic count. You, you can't dismiss the possibility of this diagnosis. And so what you need to remember to do is always look at the corrected or absolute retic count and compare them to their normal ambient labs, which our patients get every six months to a year. In the case of this person, you will also see normal white blood cells and platelets, unlike the splenic sequestration crisis, where all three can be abnormal. This person will also have a normal blood pressure, again, differentiating it from the splenic sequestration crisis. They may well have a slap cheek rash, although typically not. They may have arthropathy, um, joint pain, swelling, inflammation, again, not common, and they may have flu-like symptoms of a primary infection. And this is actually more common than any, either of the classic uh, presentations of this uh, virus. A couple of things that are important to remember about this virus. While in a normally healthy sickler, this causes a, a limited um, event, should this virus escape into the hospital community where immunocompromised patients could inquire it, they can develop pancytopenia of a severe nature and require a great deal of therapy. Pregnant women are also at risk for fetal loss as well as non-immune high drops and therefore very strict control of who takes care of this person and who interacts with this person has to be undertaken. Okay, so initial steps in treatment are obtain some labs. A CBC and retic count we've already talked about. Parvirus DNA by PCR is a great way to make a diagnosis, but it may or may not be helpful to you. Um, and while it will tell you the parvovirus is there, it won't tell you where in the steps of infection response your person is. Have they already got an IgM antibody? Do they not? And that's going to be important in terms of assessing how long they're likely to be sick. So at the same time, you want to do parvovirus IgG and IgM titers. If somebody already has IgG to parvovirus, it's unlikely that they're having any plastic crisis. Look harder for other things. Type impossible. You may or may not need to transfuse this person. If you already know their hemoglobin's low or they're clinically symptomatic, then go ahead and order a type in cross match. They're going to need IV access. They're going to need at least maintenance fluids, depending on what the plan is for transfusion. And they're going to need very strict, hardcore isolation. These are persons who need to be contact droplet and no pregnant caregivers isolation. Okay, In normal persons with sickle cell or other hemolytic anemias who are otherwise healthy, we should expect to see resolution of the anemia, or stabilization at least, once the development of a, a neutralizing antibody occurs. Once that happens, the virus simply stops replicating in other cells. It can't spread from, from previously infected cells to new ones. 
The person may well need multiple transfusions, though, to get through to that point. In an immunocompromised person, um, this can last for months. They can not only have anemia, but they can have thrombocytopenia and leukopenia, uh, and they may well have full-blown pancytopenia. Um, many patients will improve with reduction in immunosuppression. So your organ transplant patient or your bone marrow transplant patient may well get better by turning things down. If that's the case and they can tolerate that without other complications, that's the first step in treatment. If not, then therapy with IVIG or other kinds of adoptive immunity may well be needed. Well, thanks for your attention and if you have any questions, drop me an email. Bye.